Hey, everybody. Hello, hello, and welcome. And uh, thanks for your patience. I had a couple of little tech snafus. So I had to work out those little kinks before I could press the go live button. So thanks for your patience. Gosh, tech is great when it works and not so much when it doesn't, right? So anyway, hoping the quality of the video is up to par. I had to kind of regroup very quickly. Um, I think I mentioned a couple of weeks ago that I bought a new iMac specifically to run my live streams on. And uh, as I got ready to go live, uh, there was some weird thing with the internet. I could not get internet to connect. So anyway, here we are on my little laptop. So hoping you guys have a nice, um, you know, nice quality experience on your end. All right. So happy Thursday. Here we are again. It's already Thursday again. It seems like every time I turn around, it's like Thursday or Friday, right? Um, I have some really good stuff to share with you today. And uh, so today we are going to talk about some specific strategies that I put together for you to help you to grow your telehealth practice. So a lot of really um, implementable strategies. Is that a word? Implementable. I think so. Easy to implement. How's that? Some strategies that I think, you know, you can actually take away and implement, begin to implement literally today. And that's really what we're after. So guys, as you know, telehealth absolutely continues to explode. And, you know, a year ago, a little over a year ago now, you know, I think some of us thought, well, maybe it's a temporary thing, you know, with COVID and the pandemic and everything um, moving to online platforms. I think it's here to stay. Wouldn't you agree? <laughs> Type yes in the comments if you agree that we're here to stay. A little hard to predict how it's going to work with insurance. I'm hearing kind of mixed things in terms of whether or not insurance is going to continue to reimburse for telehealth services. Certainly in your cash practice, it is absolutely here to stay, which is pretty exciting. And hopefully that'll be the case for insurance based practices as well. So before we jump in, let me quickly again say hello and I want to welcome everyone. Welcome to those of you that are joining me. Uh, live, as well as those of you that are going to join the replay. So really, really happy to have you here. Um, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Leslie Vitell, and I work specifically with dietitians, naturopathic doctors, and other integrative functional practitioners who are essentially struggling, struggling with that sense of overwhelm and really all the confusion that comes along with building a successful online practice. So in my work, I teach the proven strategies so that you can integrate. Ultimately, my goal for you is to make things easy, remove all the guesswork, and ultimately be able to add multiple streams of income into your business model. And this allows you to help more people and of course, increase your profitability, increase your variety in your workday, and to ultimately be able to have time left over to enjoy your life. So that is what I'm all about. And I'm, I'm really happy to be here with you today. So again, today's topic is called seven strategies to grow your telehealth practice. I actually have a few extra bonus strategies. I think I have about 10. So, um, so we're going to take a deep dive into strategy specifically around growing telehealth and really your digital marketing strategy. So as um, I mentioned just a moment ago, telehealth really continues to explode. It's a great way to expand your business and really to be able to position yourself to help more people. It has also been shown very interestingly to increase, increase patient or client satisfaction and patient engagement, because you're eliminating the accessibility barriers, which I think is so crucial to understand. A lot of people, you know, struggle with, you know, just finding the time in their day, there's childcare issues, there's like all kinds of things that can actually get in the way or become barriers 
for your clients to see you in person in a brick and mortar setting. So I get really excited over the possibilities as we continue to build these telehealth practices. Um, it's really a win-win, I think, for both you as the practitioner as well as your client or patients. So if you are looking for strategies to grow your telehealth practice, you are definitely in the right place today because I'm going to help you do exactly that. So let me just kind of give you an overview of some of the topics that we're going to touch on today specifically. So we're going to talk about how to shift your marketing to highlight the benefits of telehealth in order to attract that right clientele that are basically looking for your services. We're going to talk about why a series of strategic touch points is critically important to move your potential client from hearing about you to becoming a paying client. And as you'll learn, that is actually a trust building process. We'll talk about the importance of developing um, and fostering relationships and grooming referral partners for your online practice. And also, of course, most importantly, those seven key strategies to grow your telehealth practice. Actually, I came up with 10. I could come up with a whole bunch, but uh, I'm going to give you a few bonus strategies as well. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. I see someone says yes. They want to grow their telehealth practice. And definitely, I, I think the question I asked was, um, do you think telehealth is here to stay? Give me a thumbs up or a yes if you think so. Be really curious to know what you're hearing out there and just the feedback you're getting from clients. Um, you know, I do want to start, not to go off on a tangent, but I want to kind of kick this conversation off by saying, well, I personally have been in the telehealth, I guess, market for many, many years. Um, when I had my nutrition practice years ago, you know, really starting about a decade ago, there was really no such thing <laughs> as like reliable video platforms. And even back then, though, I was like, you know what, I really love this idea of working from home and kind of eliminating all the overhead associated with renting an expensive office. So some of you already know this about um, me, but I I actually used to run my prep. Most of my client visits were done on the phone, believe it or not. So like true telehealth. Um, and, and it worked out great. And I do want to mention that some, I think some of the challenge just kind of looking at observing practitioners over the years and also, you know, my own experience in doing it. I think one of the hesitations or potential barriers, if you will, is the perception of value from the client, right? And I used to bump into this occasionally myself where the client would be like, oh, you know, maybe I should come to see you in person because, you know, basically I'm afraid that the value or the return on my investment won't be as great. So I think that at least prior to COVID and the pandemic, I think that was kind of the perception that it wasn't maybe as valuable, right? And clients used to say, well, you know, I should come in person because of that, right? Because I really want to get the best results. And the reality is, and I know there's studies on this. I remember going to Fancy like years ago, years and years ago. When, and I remember going into a session where they talked about um, comparing efficacy. And this was telephonic, MNT versus in person. And I just remember the outcome. It really wasn't statistically significant, right? So that's what I used to share with my clients. Like if I sensed any underlying hesitation in doing telephonic sessions, I would share, you know, honestly, there's not, uh, they've done studies on this and there's not a really significant difference in outcomes. So just to kind of reassure the client that they're still going to get great, great results. And honestly, the results might even be better because you're making it more doable for the client. They're actually able to show up. And I think that is the key. So anyway, just kind of wanted to mention that if you are comfortable with telehealth, I believe the client will be comfortable with the model as well. And of course, over the last year, things have really shifted. I think the acceptability of this model has absolutely 
been greatly enhanced, right? Because we didn't have a choice. So I think it's very um, acceptable now. And the other thing I do just want to throw out there, uh, this isn't really um, officially in the list of topics, but I do want to mention you do not have to lower your fees based on the fact that you're doing telehealth. So I think that's a really important thing. Um, it This model can actually help you increase your revenue. The value that you're providing is not certainly no less than what you would do in person. I actually used to think, to, this is me, that I did my best work uh, via phone or video. I just found there's fewer distractions. I did my best work. And so I personally think that in my case, I just feel like the value is higher than um, if I were to offer services in person. So that's just my take on it. I'd be curious to know. Um, I'd love to hear in the comments. Yeah, Nicole, it's definitely here to stay. Um, guys, let me know what your thoughts are, like with the perceived value. I'd really be curious. Give me a shout out in the comments so that we can kind of talk through this together. All right, so let's jump into some of the content I have for you today. So let's start, I want to just um, highlight some of the advantages of telemedicine, all right? So I, I alluded to some of this already, but um, let's just kind of list some of the advantages. You know, obviously comfort and convenience, you know, your virtual visits can be easier to fit into your busy schedule. And I believe the same is true for your clients as well, right? They don't really have the same set of barriers to overcome as compared to, you know, finding childcare, you know, finding a, you know, transportation, fighting traffic, you know, all these things that come up for our clients. So I feel like comfort and convenience and fewer barriers is absolutely huge. I also feel like we can increase our ability for a better assessment, potentially, right? Because telemedicine can give some of us a little, you know, we, we can kind of get a, um, a unique vantage point into the home, which I think could be, especially for some niches, extremely important in terms of the um, assessment portion of your work. Again, more continuity, um, in terms of care, again, I think this is related to fewer barriers, which means your clients are more likely to show up and show up consistently. And, um, and finally, you know, again, this has to do with mindset shifts and just the acceptability of telehealth. There, I just feel like telehealth is so much more accepted, especially in the past year. Um, by both practitioners and clients, because prior to a year ago, you know, in my role, I would hear kind of a lot of pushback from practitioners, um, a lot of fear around moving into a telehealth practice. And so I, again, it's no longer viewed as inferior as compared to in-person services. So again, I'd love to hear your take on this. Um, just really, you know, be curious to know what, what your thoughts are. All right. So let's talk about messaging. All right. So that's the first thing in the docket today is to have a quick conversation around messaging. So of course, being able to really know your ideal client and the issues they're facing is really a crucial first step in this whole process, right? So we need to know, we need to peel back the layers, drill really deep, understand who it is we're really targeting in order to have effective messaging and to ultimately create those marketing initiatives that allow you to connect, right? To, to connect and develop that trust with your potential clients. Remember, people often search online for solutions in terms of how they can overcome specific health challenges. And if you, if your, uh, you know, if your practice pops up when your audience basically is searching for solutions, you are going to be able to develop that necessary relationship with your audience to help them move into the next step, right? So. Um, so you really want to position yourself. We're going to talk more about like education-based marketing, which I'm a big fan of. 
Um, but really that's the essence. You want to get clear on your target audience. You want to get really clear on, of course, what their struggles and pain points are so that you can develop messages that are positioned as a solution to these specific struggles and pain points. Um, you know, just a quick example. So like, let's just say you specialize in irritable bowel syndrome, IBS. Um, you know, your message might revolve around, you know, are you looking for help? controlling your IBS so you can get your life back, right? Something like that. So you would want to potentially reposition the message to focus on the benefits in this case of virtual services, virtual counseling. So you might say something like, are you struggling to control your IBS, but also are challenged to find the time to get the support you need because of your busy schedule, right? So like we're kind of adding in that additional layer of um, you know the time constraints that may have been holding back your client in in terms of getting the help that they need. You know, you can say you're in the right place. I can help you rein in your IBS symptoms in the comfort of your home, own home. No travel required. You know, something like that. So basically, in your marketing message, you want to focus on. You want to. I don't think maybe focus isn't the right word, you want to weave in, maybe that's a better way to put it, you want to weave in some of the advantages of the telehealth message, which would be things like convenience, uh, long term success due to more frequent and, you know, timely counseling appointments and support. Um, you know, you do also, I believe, want to acknowledge perhaps some of their fears, some of your audience's fears, which for some people revolves around the technology, right? So um, depending on, I think, the age group of your audience, you're, you know, especially, obviously, if you're in the uh, working with older folks or, you know, it, there's just always that subset of people that are afraid of technology and it really just freaks them out. <laughs> so you definitely want to emphasize the ease of the technology. And I think also what is a good idea, I don't know if you necessarily want to put this on your website, but certainly after someone agrees to work with you, you want to help people make it really, really easy for them to understand the telehealth platform that you're working with, right? Um, because again, it might be a little stressful for them. So you just really want to make that an easy transition, maybe create, you know, a simple PDF or handout or even a, um, a quick video, a how to video that can be really helpful um, to help them understand how these actual appointments will be carried out on your telehealth platform. All right, so let's talk a little bit now about why a series of you know, strategic touch points is really important to move that client from you know, hearing about you or maybe finding you into the place of becoming a paying client or a customer. So, I mean, the idea here is that it's unlikely, generally speaking, I would say it's pretty unlikely and there's always exceptions, but generally it's unlikely that clients will be ready to book with you after just one interaction, right? Pretty much they're, they're searching, they're looking for solutions, they're researching their options. And so the goal here is I'm just such a fan of building relationships, like a real connection with prospective clients over time. And I really believe that's what good marketing is all about. So good marketing attracts people into your world and then it moves them through that continuum from hearing about you to trusting, to learning more, to eventually becoming a paying client. And it does take time, generally speaking. So in your marketing, you really want to acknowledge that, right? You want content that's going to attract their attention and bring them into your world. Again, we'll talk about that, but my favorite way to do that is through educational content, providing a ton of value. And this is what I call pull marketing, right? 
pull marketing. It's like a magnet. You're actually attracting people into your world based on the amazing content that you're providing. So guys, don't be afraid of giving away, you know, too much for free. I mean, of course you want to be strategic here, but generally speaking, you know, you, you want to attract people into your world by useful, really, you know, helpful content, original content, original content. Um, and much of that content can really revolve around educating your client. That is the best way to provide value. And again, develop those necessarily necessary touch points for them to eventually become paying clients. So basically in every, you know, email, video, uh, social post or any other kind of piece of content, I really want you to think of it as an opportunity to build on that on that relationship. All right. And really aim to be authentic, um, relatable. That's super important. People want to know the person behind the brand. And I think that's super important in this day and age. And so ultimately during this series of different touch points, again, prospects and leads are nurtured to eventually becoming that paying client. So that is, I think, of critical, um, uh, I think that's super important. All right, so um, I am going to, uh, I'm gonna take a look at, yeah, I'm going to take a look at some of the comments in just a few moments. So let's keep going with some of these strategies. And so right now I'm going to move into those seven, actually, I think 10 strategies that you can begin to implement in your practice to attract new clients to your business. All right. So let's go ahead and knock those off right now. So, um, I mean, there's so many ways, like I could I could go on and on for days <laughs> in terms of strategies. I really could. So I just picked, you know, 10 that I thought would be helpful. Um, some of them you may already be familiar with. And sh I'm, in fact, I'm pretty sure some are and maybe some are new. So the way I would look at this is just trying to think about like what are what's one thing that you can maybe improve on? Um, maybe one thing that you can do that you're not already doing, like just pick one thing to take away from today. And I'd love to hear what that one thing is. So if you hear it while I'm going through this list, please drop that in the comments. All right. Um, honestly, I'd love to hear like what really stands out for you as your next step. And the other thing is it'll kind of help you to develop a little bit of a, um, a little bit of, um, I guess, accountability, right? If you put it out publicly, uh, you know, I think you're more apt to do it, right? So, so take advantage of that accountability. All right. So, all right. So the first one is a strong website. Okay. So I know that's probably not a huge shock. Um, but it, I do think, especially in this online world, we do want to have a strong website and you really want to be cognizant of the messaging. Again, website copy, I could go on and on and on about this. Actually, just FYI, um, I'm in the, pro and this is a total sidebar, <laughs> um, but I am excited. I'm in the process of, um, I'm going to have a pretty cool little online funnel on my website coming up. Um, I think it'll probably be live, hopefully by the end of next week. So the first step will be, uh, an opportunity for you to download seven client attraction PDFs. And then the next step in this little funnel will be an opportunity to download um, a little mini course that I put together on how to write copy for a client attracting website. So I would say by the end of next week, that should be live. And it's, it's really inexpensive. Um, really a great deal, like videos, tons of videos and PDFs included. So anyway, just want to mention that um, because I look at a lot of websites and the work that I do. And the one thing I will say is quite often, and I did this too, guys, so I completely get it. It's very me centric, right? It's very practitioner focused. And the reality is that 
you know, honestly, it we want to kind of shift that. We want your content to be positioned to solve your target audience's problems, or at least to let them know that, you know, in the work that you do, you can acknowledge where they are now, where they want to be instead, and let them know that you have the solution to help get them there. So that's super important. And um, really, that is the kind of content that essentially should be on every page, like a little, you know, different in terms of wording and things like that. But that is pretty much it. It needs to be about them, not so much about you. Now, your credentials absolutely matter. Don't get me wrong. They do matter. But when someone first lands on your website, that's not the first thing they're looking for, right? They want to be drawn in. They want to know they're in the right place. And then they're like, okay, I think I'm in the right place. This person might be onto something. Let me check out their creds to see if they're the real deal, right? So I do think that's really important. All right, so a really good website is, is key and you know, you want to be really, really crystal clear on what is the action you want people to take, okay? Because again, remember, now there's always exceptions, right? But a lot of times people are not, when they're searching for solutions, maybe they're not quite ready to book an appointment. Maybe they're kind of looking for their options and kind of exploring that. So you want to remember that on your website. So in my opinion, collecting leads on that website is one of its main jobs. It's different than the you know, even, you know, three years ago, two years ago, I think things were a little different where your website was kind of like your online brochure. It's not really that way anymore. Um, and it's just because we're so inundated with content and copy and messaging. People just are moving at a much faster pace. So your job on that website is to attract leads and to collect leads. Okay. And it's a bonus if you get someone visiting that site that's actually ready to book an appointment with you. So just remember that you want to use your site as a mechanism to build your list because your list is really, really important. OK, and by doing so, that's what gives you the opportunity. Once you build up that list, it gives you the opportunity to communicate and nurture those leads. Okay, so that's super important. Of course, you want to integrate keywords and SEO and all that good stuff. Um, that's also important. And we'll we'll talk a little bit more about, oh, well, actually, yeah, um, that's number three. So let's go on to number two. So number one, create a strong website um, that is very strategic in terms of messaging and is very clear call to action or actions, right? You don't want to overdo the CTAs because a confused mind does not make a decision. So really get clear on what is that next step you want your client to take, okay? And that's really what you focus on. Number two is, especially in this day and age, you wanna have a free download, some kind of a downloadable gift, right? Or a giveaway that would be interesting to your target audience. Um, and again, this is gonna help you to collect those email addresses, in exchange for giving away the freebie. There's so many different options out there. Um, there's, you know, assessments and quizzes. People love those, especially if those are designed to help people to self-identify, to raise their hand and say, oh my gosh, I do need this person's help, right? Those are really effective. Um, you know, you can do like tips and guides and worksheets, workbooks, eBooks, like all those things. Number three is creating outstanding content that educates, all right? Again, I'm such a fan of marketing that educates because again, that's pull marketing. It's not like being pushy or, you know, those yucky things that, yeah, we don't want to do that. We don't want to be like, um, we don't want to be that person that's, you know, like stalking people on Facebook, right? Mm -mm. You want to be that expert and really create that sense of authority through educational content. And creating content that educates your audience is, of course, beneficial for search engine optimization, 
especially if you're posting it in the form of, you know, a blog or something like that on your video, which I highly recommend. Um, you know, you're, you're driving long-term traffic from the search engines to your website over a period of time, which is super helpful. And most importantly, you're producing and distributing quality content, again, in the form of blog posts, eBooks, articles, white papers, you know, all kinds of different ways. And this helps give value to your reader and build trust um, amongst your audience over time. And, you know, gosh, I could really share a lot about the content, but, you know, essentially it should help. I think it should help answer the questions that your clients or patients are regularly asking. So that's a great way to kind of organize your content. What are some really common questions that you hear all the time? Like you could, you know, probably have like a year's worth of content, right? If you just did that alone, brainstorm a list of commonly asked questions and write a little article about it or a blog. That is going to be like gold because if your patients or clients are asking those questions, most likely lots of other people in the world are asking and it's it's going to be something that is super valuable and it's definitely going to attract people to your website through search engine optimization. So um, so I think that is super helpful. So you know bottom line here is creating original content that is educational in, format. Um, and it, it comes in the form of maybe blogs, it could be podcasts, videos, social media posts, you know, any of those things. And guys, just a quick tip on that. Um, I teach a lot of this content creation strategy in the work that I do. But for now, let me just kind of give you a little tip. Because content creation can be very overwhelming. I get that. In a nutshell, you want to go at this, you want to be very strategic and streamlined, okay, because otherwise it can suck the life out of you. Give me a thumbs up if you agree, okay? I'm telling you, it can be, it can just take a lot of time. And you're like, how am I going to do this? Let me just share when it comes to content creation, you, all right, here it is. You want to have a monthly theme, just come up with a theme. Okay, just pick a theme, come up with like four subtopics, one for each week. And once you come up with those topics, like basically I'm asking you to come up with kind of a bigger picture theme for the month and then split that into four like bite-sized topics. Once you're able to do that, it's gonna make your life so much easier. Repurpose your content, all right? I really am a firm believer in repurposing. You don't have to create all new stuff for every platform. You're basically extracting from that original piece of content to help you to repurpose and reuse your stuff for other platforms. So I know I could go into a lot more detail there, um, but I'm hoping that helps at least simplify it a little bit. And I will also say, when it comes to writing content, if you are going down the rabbit hole you know, researching and doing all this stuff, you're, you're really, you're, you're not doing it right. I'll just be blunt. You guys already know this stuff. It's in your head. You don't need to go down the rabbit hole with research. And really people don't want to read research. Your ideal client, assuming your ideal client is not other practitioners, your ideal client wants practical strategies so if you're finding yourself going like overboard with research, I would say rein it in and just think top level, think practical tips and strategies. And I think that should help. All right. So, all right. So we are on number four. Okay. So number four is to integrate um, social proof and in the form of testimonials, like on your website, social media, on your newsletters, because here's the deal. People love hearing how someone just like them was successful, right? It gives them inspiration. It gives them hope. And it also shows that you have helped other people that are in a similar boat as they are. And 
I have read perhaps probably higher than this, but at least 70% of consumers say that they check feedback about a product or service before they, um, before they actually invest. I venture to say it might even be a little higher. I mean, think about the last time you bought anything, um, you know, like on Amazon or anything like that without looking at the reviews. I mean, you just don't, you just look, right? Like that's just a normal part of what we do for the most part. So um, if you are not gathering testimonials, I highly recommend you do it. Um, now, of course, you wanna make sure Full disclaimer, I'm not a lawyer, not an attorney. So you guys really want to abide by the Federal Trade Commission um, rules. So you can look up, I think it's FTC, FTC.com or FTC. Maybe it's .gov. Okay, just to see if there's any special regulations in your state. And of course, do remember, please get your client's permission. I would say that's really important get them to sign off and actually give you permission to use their testimonial. But once you do that, um, you can use, you know, uh, social proof in the form of testimonials on your website. You can use it on um, really, I mean, everywhere. And it's just really super helpful. All right. I'm just taking a look at the time. Time flies. All right. Uh, so next are videos. I'm really a fan of uh, video marketing. And I mean, I feel like clients can really get used to seeing you virtually. You know, start small. You don't have to, you know, go out of the gate, you know, doing like weekly Facebook lives unless you want to. I just, I did that a year and a half ago. And um, I just made a commitment that I'm going to go live every week. And I pretty much stuck to it. It's not always easy. I'll be honest. There are days when it's not easy at all. But I do feel like if you show up for your audience on a regular basis, I, I'm a firm believer that good things happen. And I've, you know, I've experienced that as have my clients. Um, it really, really helps. And I think I'm really a fan of live video, but if you're not ready for live, that's okay. You can start with, you know, recording videos and then uploading them. Eventually you want to go to live though. I really want to nudge you in that direction. People really, I'll just be honest with you. It not only attracts people to your audience, but it, again, it helps move them. It makes the sales process so much easier because what happens, and guys, I hear this from my clients that do it. They'll say, oh my gosh, you know, the leads that come in now, they're all ready, ready to buy, which is so amazing because there's really like nothing more frustrating than investing so much time like on these discovery calls. And then people are like, yeah, you know, let me think about it. <laughs> um, which PS is probably a problem with how you're structuring your sales calls. So I don't want to diminish that. But if you've got a good blueprint for doing your sales calls and you're doing video, it, it's really a great combination because people are just, they get, they know you, they trust you, they come to you and they're like, oh my gosh, I already feel like I know you. I want to do this. And that's why it's so fantastic. So, so helpful. So if video, if you're not doing it, I want to I want to encourage you to take that leap of faith. I really do. So, um, you know, just uh, just get started, like get started with maybe Instagram live or even a video that you put on your website that introduces you. I think that would be great, especially the videos on your site. You want to keep them short and sweet. All right, let's keep going. Uh, number six, build a referral network. Okay, super, super key. And even though you are now virtual, um, it's interesting. Uh, you know, you can still foster relationships in your own backyard. It really doesn't matter where you're providing the service. Okay, that's really key. So even though you're virtual, you still want to leverage, you know, relationships and opportunities, networking in your own backyard. Of course, you can expand that beyond your backyard, but um, I, I do think that's super helpful. So just remember to reach out to other providers, um, you know, community organizations and other businesses where 
ask yourself, where is my ideal client hanging out? What other services are they seeking? That's where you go. Guys, it could be a hair salon, right? Do your clients get haircuts? Probably. Then you could go there. I, in fact, I used to do that. Um, many of you know this. I used to have a a uh, really great relationship with um, uh, uh, Avalon or Aveda hair salon near me. And they did a lot of community events for women. And it was a great, you know, kind of um, uh, beneficial relationship for both parties. So think about where your client is going, other providers, other, you know, businesses, and just approach it with curiosity, right? Reach out to those organizations, swing by, stop by, and just say, you know, here's what I'm doing. Um, I love I love what you're doing. It, can you, you know, do you want to have a chat about how to collaborate potentially? And just approach with curiosity. All right, so it's a great, um, I think this is a great way to build relationships in your community. And um, good things come out of it. I, I literally can promise. Okay, number seven, online databases. So you want to increase your online footprint, right? You want to make yourself more findable when your ideal client is searching for solutions online. So I think a great way to expand your marketing is, um, you know, is to look into databases that your business can be listed. Okay, so, you know, Google My Business, certainly health profs, depending on the work that you do, like there's so many different options, you want to populate those and you do want to make sure that your, um, your profile is updated and client centric. All right, so let's, uh, so those are seven, let's go into let's see, I've got three bonus tips. So bonus tip number one is through interviews. So I think a great way to get your online practice um, front and center is potentially through like media interviews. So whether it's online, print, TV, you know, whatever kind of media outlet. So why not, you know, reach out and share about your online practice, your niche, and ways you're benefiting your local community. So oftentimes this is overlooked, but I do want to encourage you to look into doing this. Um, you know, I can speak from a little experience here. I didn't do a lot of like um, TV kind of media, but I did quite a bit of written and it definitely helped me to, um, when I had my nutrition practice, get my business in front of my target audience, which was great. All right, bonus tip number two, networking. So this is a little bit of a spinoff on um, generating, you know, referral partners, but um, networking, I have observed this networking, I think it's an underutilized thing in, in this day and age. I, I really think so. It used to be the top thing. I kind of see it falling to the bottom of the list now. And um, I really want you to bring it more to the top because a lot of success, I believe, is based on relationship. So, you know, Instagram, who knows, can come and go, right? Social media can come and go. Relationships, I think, are just more lasting. And quite frankly, I think I, I would do it. If you're, if you're not networking, I would... I would definitely look for opportunities to do so because I think it can greatly benefit you. All right, so what are you looking for? Um, well, of course, networking with other practitioners. Again, especially those that work with your target audience, maybe in a different way. Maybe therapists, psychologists, acupuncturists, you know, lunch and learns, other professional gatherings. That could be great. I especially like the idea of networking or getting involved with organizations that serve your target audience. Those are really my favorite. So look for opportunities like that. Um, you know, you how about just having like an uh, a Zoom tea or coffee, you know, with people, you know, practitioners or other professionals that you want to network with. So um, definitely would recommend that you look for opportunities 
to, you know, really just to, just to chat. And again, guys, just approach it from curiosity. That's my best piece of advice. You don't have to know exactly how this is going to pan out, right? Because you don't have a crystal ball. How would you know? But networking, I think, is huge. Guys, give me a shout out on the comments. I'm going to read the comments and do a little interaction as soon as I'm done with one more tip. Let me know what, what, you, what do you think about networking? Are you doing it? Do you have questions? If so, if you're doing it, what is working for you? Are you having online coffee, you know, on Z like Zoom coffee with other practitioners? Let me know what's working. I want to hear from you. All right, number, so this is tip number 10. And so this is bonus tip three. Okay, I touched on this a little bit already, but I want to emphasize, you want to increase your online footprint, okay? So that when someone searches for you, so like if you get a referral from let's say a psychologist or someone, the first thing that person's gonna do is they're going to type your name and look you up and see if you're the real deal, right? So you want to have like a whole bunch of things pop up when that person types in your name. So of course, you know, your website, your social media bios, directory listings, right? Like all these things. So the tip here is to update all of your, well, update or populate if you haven't done it yet, all of your social media bios and directory listings. Super, super important. Um, for example, even if you're not really active on LinkedIn, go ahead and update your bio, right? Make yourself more findable online. So again, when potential clients get a recommendation, whether it's from a family or friend or another healthcare provider, they typically decide to conduct their own little research online about you. So you want to make sure that you pop up. And so you want to ultimately ensure that your practice is listed everywhere possible so that potential clients or patients can easily find you. And um, ultimately, this is so important because it is going to drive more traffic to your website and ultimately, you know, provide more business to your practice. So those are my tips. Do you guys have any other ones that are working for you? I'd love to hear. All right, guys, I'm going to take a peek at. All right, let me see what everyone has to say here. Yeah, it's definitely so telehealth is here to stay. Absolutely. Um, let's see. So let's see. Um, I agree. I do phone mostly and feel like the work I do. Okay. I feel like I work more to prove myself hard to keep track of time. Okay. So yeah. And you know, the th one thing I would say, Alia is that, you know, just one little tip. Um, I, I don't know if this is directly connected to what you said, but just as a reminder, I believe so strongly that we have to put some of the client, uh, the burden of responsibility for results on our client's shoulders, right? Because, you know, we don't have a magic wand. They actually have to do the work. So in terms of proving yourself, maybe we can, I don't know, maybe shift that a little bit into putting that responsibility, like you are the expert and you are going to collaborate and support that person to those endpoints, right? But they have to do the work. So maybe just um, sometimes a little shift there in that burden of responsibility can be helpful. And yes, it's um, so interesting. Alia says it's um, tele, uh, telemedicine is less intimidating for the client as well. I completely agree. Um, I love it for that for lots of reasons. Okay, so. Um, hey, Nicole. So Nicole has says, I have always felt that the perceived value may be less by offering telehealth and appreciate you mentioning the outcomes of the study. Yeah. And that we don't have to lower our fees. Absolutely. Oh, my gosh, guys, if you take one thing away from today, if you are under the impression that you have to lower your fees because you're doing your work online, I hope, 
I really hope that I can shift that mindset. Oh my gosh. I, in a nutshell, don't lower your fees for telehealth. Why? It's, it's just as effective. Guys, I haven't looked for studies lately. Oh my gosh. If anyone knows of any more recent studies, could you let me know? I'm sure they're out there. I just haven't really taken the time to look. But um, in a nutshell, I don't think we should lower our fees and the efficacy. I mean, even like this had to be 10, 12 years ago, the efficacy for MNT telephone versus in person was pretty darn similar. So I would imagine that would certainly be the case with the ability to see via video. Okay. Um, okay. So Cindy, Hey, Cindy, I have a lot of money. I'm not having to print. Oh, I save a lot of money, right? By not having to print handouts. So good. So much better. Right? Absolutely agree. And let's see here. Alia. Hey, um, absolutely. They do have to do the work, but sometimes they don't see that. It, I know it, it can be challenging. Um, which actually is a whole nother possible idea for a Facebook live. Thanks for giving me that, Alia. You know, how to shift that responsibility to the client. Um, because at the end of the day, it really is up to them to implement. You can partner with them. You can collaborate with them. You can help them set goals. You can help them be accountable. But at the end of the day, they have to actually do it, right? All right, guys. So that is what I have for you today. Thank you so much for joining me. I hope this was helpful. And uh, I'll look forward to seeing you next week. Bye for now.